Hey, thanks for checking out this sermon. It's designed to help you take your next step with Jesus. And if you haven't been able to make it to one of our campuses and participate in the time of giving, you could do so online through our website or by texting to give so that you can continue to participate in the mission that God has given us. We hope that God speaks to you through this sermon. everybody. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you guys tonight. My name is Kim Rogers. Uh, My family and I have been attending Cornerstone for about the last 14 years, and I've been serving as just a volunteer leader here for much of that time. And I'm pumped that I get to finish up the series that we've been doing that's entitled The Anatomy of Love. Whether you're in one of our five campuses or you're watching from online or in the incarcerated church, uh, the first words that I want you to hear from me today are the words, you are loved. You are loved. And it's, it's not like the bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus or Jesus loves you type of love. I'm talking a deep, longing unconditional, arms wide open type of love, an agape love. You might remember earlier on in this series that there are, we learned about several Greek words that we translate into one word, love. Agape love, the love that Paul is unpacking here, it's not brotherly love or just sort of friendship Love. It's not a romantic love. It's not a I love pizza or I love Mexican food type of love, even though those are like legit real love right there. He's talking about agape love. And agape love is the selfless, unconditional love of God. That's the love we're talking about. And that love was demonstrated for us in Jesus. Two years ago, my husband and I adopted our daughter, Destiny. It was this amazing, miraculous sort of thing where God said, uh, you're going to adopt and you're not going to use an agency. I'm just going to bring you a baby and you'll know it's me. Oh, and it's going to be a girl and her name will be Destiny. It was an incredible thing and God actually did those things. Um, But I want to tell you three things that stand out to me from our experience. Number one, it is as if my daughter Destiny is my biological child. I, I, there's just no difference. I will, I'll catch myself saying, um, that was right before I had Destiny. But I didn't technically have Destiny. I will say it was like the easiest labor of all three of my kids. Um, And I'd be like out with her when she was eight or nine weeks old. And, uh, you know, women, how we are, they would be like, you look amazing. And I'd be like, Pilates, you know, whatever. (laughs) Lost that baby weight, just like that. Um, Yeah. Number two, I longed for her. I longed for her. I did not feel complete. She was born in my heart before I ever held her in my arms. And thirdly, every day I feel so lucky to be her mom. I feel so fortunate and blessed that I was chosen to be her mom. In the first message in this series, Steve Madsen talked about a God who seeks to adopt sons and daughters. He is longing for you. You are in his heart already, whether or not he's in yours yet, you're in his. 
He is full of expectation and hope, longing for you to choose him, that he would be your father, that you would be his son or his daughter. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, he desires all would come to know him. This is my husband, Darren, holding our daughter, Destiny. He is full of pride. He is full of love. He is full of joy. And you know that this man will do anything for that little baby that he's holding. That's a picture of how God is with you tonight. And when you choose him to be your father, he holds you and he's like, welcome to the family. God's agape love, it's an adoptive love. You're given a new name, you're given a new identity, you're grafted into a new family. On Destiny's birth certificate, it has my name as her mom. When God adopts you, you're his child. If you hear nothing else tonight, I want you to hear this, that there is a God out there, a loving God, who is using all of his creation to try to show you his agape love for you. So let's look at today's text. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm actually going to start in verse 8 because Paul does something really cool here. Um, Verse 8 beautifully closes out the first seven verses. And we know that God's love doesn't fall. It doesn't crumble. It never fails us. But verse 8, it's also the first of two verses on love that sort of bookend our text tonight. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read verses 8 through the end of the chapter. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I am fully known. But now faith, hope, love, Abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. The verbs Paul uses tell us that all of what he's saying in verse 8 is in the context of the eschaton. Um, Put simply, the eschaton is just the end of the world. No big deal. The end of the world when Jesus returns. It's the final event in God's divine plan. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a warning because I'm kind of a nerd that I love all the Greek language stuff that the Bible comes with. Um, You're going to get a bit of that today. The The New Testament was originally written in the Greek, and then we have it translated into English. And many times there's a richness or um, a deeper understanding to a word when we look at it in its original form. So you might want to buckle up for that because I got that coming and I just, I love it. So eschaton is from the Greek word eschatos, and it means last. More specifically, eschatology um, stands for four things that are the last things. The last death, the last judgment, the last heaven, and the last hell. It's basically an examination on the final destiny of mankind. So Paul is saying, in light of the eschaton, in light of Jesus coming back, Prophecy will be done away with. Tongues will cease and knowledge will end. What Paul is talking about here, when you read the chapters before it, he's talking about the temporary nature of spiritual gifts. Therefore, this time now, while we're on earth in the present, 
Paul loved prophecy. You can read in chapter 14 where he goes on about how much he loves prophecy. It's, it's this supernatural thing. It edifies and builds up the church. The Corinthians loved tongues and words of knowledge, which words of knowledge weren't just book knowledge. Words of knowledge were another spiritual gift where um, somebody would be given sort of an insight into God's thoughts on a matter or on a circumstance. Paul is telling them, look, I get it that you guys love your gifts. I know they're fun, I know they're really cool, and you guys are getting really caught up in that. But they're gonna be done away with. They're gonna be done away with. And this word for done away is katargeo. And it means to render idle, inactivate, inoperative, unemployed. So basically when Jesus comes back, all the gifts are gonna be laid off. Like there's, there'll be, you know, thanks for your service, you don't spark joy, we're gonna, you know, thank you, but we're moving on from you. They will not be necessary. All of the spiritual gifts mentioned in chapter 12 and throughout the New Testament by Paul, they're manifestations of the Holy Spirit for the benefit of the church in its present state, but they will not be needed when the perfect comes. Some denominations take these verses and they take it out of Paul's context um, of the eschaton and they teach that the spiritual gifts all ended when the last apostle died. But that's not what's being said here. Those gifts are still needed today. Spiritual gifts are, are just a conduit for God's love and direction and power and healing. It's, it's his way to edify and encourage the church body. But when we get to heaven, they won't be necessary. We won't need to prophesy about Christ coming when we are sitting across from Jesus. We won't need to speak in a spiritual language that our mind doesn't understand when we're in the presence of God himself. Verse 10, Paul says, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Many times when this word for perfect is used in the New Testament, it's referring to the return of Jesus. And when the perfect comes, and we find ourselves in the eternal presence of the perfect one, the gifts will come to an end. Paul then gives us an illustration to further emphasize how the gifts were needed now, but they won't be needed then. And he talks about, he uses the analogy of a child in verse 11. Um, did any of you know that when babies are born, they have something called a startle reflex? It's called the moral reflex. And they actually start to feel like they've lost some support and that they're falling. And it's often when they're falling asleep and they will jerk themselves awake and usually start crying because they're afraid. Kind of, kind of like, Maybe when you're a little older and you're dozing off, maybe it, like at the big game last weekend, which I heard was really boring, but you know, or Thanksgiving, you're dozing off and then you kind of start to dream that you're doing something super exciting that you probably don't do in real life, like you're slalom skiing or you're doing something, and then you fall or something and you jerk yourself awake. Well, because of this moral reflex, babies like to be swaddled. And we used something in our home called a miracle blanket because you can swaddle them super tight. I think sometimes my husband would even like have his knee in their chest and like wrenching it, you know, wrapping it around super tight. So they would be like a grain of rice, like so tight. They, were, they loved it. They slept great and it worked great until they started rolling over and then their like face would be in the mattress and then that was like, that was not good. But there came a time when the swaddle wasn't necessary. Now, I will note that in Japan, swaddles are trending again for adults, so if you're looking for some extra peace, Japan, they'll swaddle you. It's the same thing with pacifiers. Pacifiers, babies need them. They start with this need, to, it's soothing to them, it's an innate need to, um, it's like a sucking reflex, to eat and to be soothed. But there comes a time where they no longer need them. And then the pacifier comes, 
And she gathers up all the grimy, smelly, forgotten passies all over the house, and she takes them to a new baby who needs all the passies. That's what we tell our kids. The passy fairy looks remarkably like a garbage man, and she rolls up in a big green and white truck and takes those passies. But the point is, Paul's saying, you don't need them anymore. The word for child here is actually an adjective, childish. And he's saying childish things are appropriate for children. Just as the gifts are appropriate and necessary for right now, they're the active work of the Holy Spirit in the church, there's going to be a time where they're not needed. And the childish things will be put away. I love verse 12 because we get to look at the historical context. And because I'm a nerd, I love when I study, you you, you gotta look at context. And so you have textual context. So when you're reading something, you wanna know what happened before it and you wanna know what's coming after it. And then you have historical context where you look and see what was going on, what are the demographics, what was happening politically, what could Paul have been addressing? Well, Corinth was famous as a producer of fine bronze mirrors, some of the finest. So it's no accident Paul is using this analogy of a bronze mirror. The word translated in my Bible as dimly is en enigmati, and it's where we get our word enigma, which is a puzzling or inexplicable occurrence or situation. It literally means like a riddle or something obscure. While some believe Paul was hinting that there was a lack of clarity or maybe you couldn't see in the mirrors very well, the majority of scholars believe he was saying that we see in a mirror indistinctly. It's just not very distinguishable. Uh, The emphasis isn't that the image was blurred or dim per se because that would have kind of been offensive to the Corinthians to use it in that way. It's more of the indirect nature of looking into a mirror. When you look into a mirror, you're not really looking at your face. You're looking at a reflection of your face. Um, It made me think of a side view mirror on our cars. You don't really see the car that's next to you, right? You see a reflection of the car that's next to you. It's like that. And as a side, I want you to know what it says on the mirror. Most mirrors have this. It says, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. And honestly, I think that's for someone here tonight because you need to be reminded that when you're looking at God and it's indirectly, that he is closer than he's appearing right now. You may not feel like he's right there, but I'm telling you, he is closer than he appears. It also made me think of a changing room, ladies, right? You go into a changing room, and if there's four mirrors, you use every square inch of all four of those mirrors. Like, to see if somebody at a 67-degree angle can actually, if you look okay from that angle, you kind of size everything up. Do guys do this? No? I asked a couple guys. One said, we just think we look good in everything. (laughs) Another one said, my wife buys my clothes. Um, Or says, here, honey, I bought this for you. It will look good. Or guys just sort of pick it up in their size and leave the store. It's kind of like that. In our present circumstances, we see God indirectly. No one has seen him face to face. Not even Moses, who it says he talked to him face to face, but it's figurative. He really just had conversations with him. 1 John 4, 12 says, no one has ever seen God, but there will be a day when we do. There will be a day when we see him face to face, and that's what Paul is talking about, this unhindered fellowship with agape love, face to face. And when that day comes, everything is gonna make sense. Everything will be made clear. The things that we've wrestled with, the questions that we've grappled with, why God, why now, why that, the confusion surrounding our circumstances, the doubt that we're really loved or that we're really lovable, the feeling maybe that we're not good enough, our fears, our failures, our addictions, 
our heartache, our shame, on that day, they will bow the knee to love. Verse 13, he says, faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now, people inside the church and outside the church know this phrase. I'm pretty sure Pinterest in their corporate office has an entire wing dedicated to faith, hope, love, right? Everybody knows that term. Even in scripture, faith, hope, and love are a familiar triad in all the preaching. You find it in several different books of the New Testament. They're connected. And they were well known to the Corinthians, those three terms, because they sum up the Christian existence. You have faith in God, you trust in his grace and his mercy for you. You have hope for a future, for salvation, which has been guaranteed, and you have love for one another and community as you walk out your life in faith and in hope. Some scholars debate that faith, hope, and love all last forever. But most others disagree because Paul, in his text, is all about what's necessary. What is really necessary? And when I'm looking at love incarnate face to face, there are some things that I won't need. I will not need faith, which is what? Belief without seeing. And I won't need to hope in my salvation because I will be face to face with my salvation. Romans 8, 24 says, hope that is seen is not hope. So we won't need faith or hope. Noted theologian Gordon Fee says, hope does not seem to be a meaningful concept once it has been realized. It's like you're sitting at in and out with your, you know, double-double animal style and you're like, I really hope I get to have in and out for lunch today. That wouldn't make sense because you're right there having it. So for Paul, faith and hope accompany love, but the greatest of these is love. Because even though they all abide in the present, only love continues on into eternity. Because God is love, there is no starting point and no end. Love is eternal. So then we come back to love never fails in this context. It has been from the beginning of time and it will never be made inactive. It is the one thing that is here and in heaven. I see love like a wide river that's kind of flowing above time and space. The Amazon River, in its dry season, is about seven miles wide. That's about the distance if you were to walk from one side of San Francisco to the other. That's wide. In the rainy season, it's about 24 miles wide, which is about the width of the entire island of Kauai. Who wants to go to Kauai now? You're like, let's go. That's a wide river. And that's how I want you to picture the love of God, this agape love of God. It is a wide river. It's a river that never dries up because its source is God. And we have access to it by the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you why that's important. Because even though his love never fails, ours does. Ours does. When we met Destiny's birth mom, she was only about seven weeks pregnant. And she was scared and angry and hurting and was betrayed. Um, and it was, it was hard. And I remember asking God, because I was a little bit impatient on his timing and him working out this miracle thing that he did, and I wrote in my journal, like, why are we meeting her at seven weeks? Why aren't we meeting her at, like, seven months, you know? Why aren't we meeting her further along? And his answer was very clear. He said, I need you to love her, and I need you to show her my love. Now, notice that those are two different things. 
And I didn't really get the implication of that until I was working on this series. God knew that my capacity to love her was not gonna be enough. Showing her his love would go beyond what I would be able to do on my own. Because I was gonna hit walls of offense. I was gonna run into walls of doubt. I was gonna have frustration stop my love in its tracks. I was gonna have things that were gonna bring my love to its limits. But God's love keeps going when ours stops. God's love keeps going when ours stops. It keeps forgiving when ours stops. It keeps reconciling when ours stops. So we have to love the people around us with his love. Because our capacity to love some of the broken and hurting and angry people out there, it's gonna have an end. And we're gonna feel like, I don't even think I can love them. But God's love keeps going when ours stops past when we feel like they deserve it, beyond whether or not they've said they're sorry. I think for a parent, it can be easy easy to offer grace and forgiveness to your children, but then you go into the office and you don't want to offer that to your workers or your your boss or the employees. We don't want to offer that grace to adults because they should know better but we're called to offer that love to everyone. The same grace and forgiveness that you give your family, your roommate, your best friend, you need to offer that to your boss and your coworker. For some of you, it's opposite. The same grace and forgiveness and kindness that you offer those people at work, you need to come home and bring that to your family or your roommate. So we dip into that river that is ever running, ever flowing, ever for us. We draw from it and we love them with his love. It's not easy. It means forgiving. It means getting out of our comfort zone and being inconvenienced. It means stepping over an offense and building bridges to communicate God's love. It doesn't always come natural to us, but we have to try. We have to try. The East Bay is depending on us. The world is depending on us to try. There are a couple things we can look out for that I think work against us in our call to love with God's agape love, and they are busyness and unforgiveness. Busyness Broken down is very self-seeking. The apostle Paul's love for others is what got him through a lot of hard times. His world was bigger than himself. When you think about yourself, your world gets very small, right? What you need, what you need to do, where you need to go, you've got your to-do lists, which I have a love-hate. I love when they're all checked and I hate when there's empty boxes. And you have to admit that when you have a to-do list, there's hardly ever a box where you're like, show someone God's love. You know, we don't have, we don't fit that kind of stuff in. It can be really easy to get caught up in only our own lives. If you think about lately, when you say, how are you? How often the response is, oh, I'm so busy. We're busy. So we have our eyes focused on our lists. We go throughout our days with our schedule and our calendar and our stuff all at our fingertips. And all those things push us through the day until evening. But we can't love the world if we don't look up and see the world. I have a friend who uh, was having a really hard day this last week and um, was crying in her car and she had ordered Starbucks and she was so upset she drove past the pay window at Starbucks. So she had to kind of get herself together and walk inside to pay. And the worker behind the counter says, are you okay? And she's like, I'm fine, you know. And she had felt in the car while she was crying, I really need a hug. And as she's telling the lady she's fine, she feels like the Holy Spirit says, she's gonna hug you. 
And the girl asks her again, are you okay? And then she walks around the counter and comes and gives my friend a hug. And she just started weeping. She said, I felt God's agape love through the hug of this stranger. Because this barista was willing to look up out of all of her tasks, see a need and come around and show love to her. Busyness is a hindrance to our ability to love. So now we'll talk about unforgiveness. We know, we all know, that unforgiveness is toxic. Unforgiveness restrains our love, which is why Satan loves it so much. Um, we have to be proactively cleaning up our record of wrongs, even the smallest of offenses, because they grow. And I know it can be hard, and I know there are things that you don't want to forgive, especially if they haven't apologized or they haven't asked for forgiveness. I have had to forgive horrible things in my life. And I know that there are many of you here that have had to forgive horrible things. But we have to forgive so those things don't weigh us down, so they don't consume our minds, so they don't rot in bitterness and anger and depression. So they won't harden us and restrain our ability to love the world. The Greek word aphiemi, which is used for forgiveness, listen to what it means. It means to leave something behind. It means to lay it aside or to abandon it. You're putting distance. That's the idea. So you set it down, you walk past it, and you move on with your life. Forgiveness is not saying what happened is okay. Forgiveness is saying, I'm going to take that thing and I'm just going to set it down, good riddance, I'm gonna keep walking and I'm not gonna let it control my destiny, my decision making, how I've loved myself or the world around me. I'm gonna leave it there and keep going. Yes, you will struggle with some that are hard to love. In your own might, you will struggle. But agape love is in your DNA because you were made in God's image and God is love. And you have this river to draw from where you have access to patience, kindness, trust, forgiveness. So you can love the world using his limitless love. Will it sometimes be exhausting? Absolutely. Will it be worth it? Absolutely. We also have to access this agape love we've been talking about, this river. We have to access it for ourselves. To receive a love that is beyond what we think we deserve. Maybe it, to receive a love that's beyond what someone else told us we deserve. Beyond what a human would give us grace for. When we feel like we've stepped beyond forgiveness or like the prodigal son where we've just screwed up too much, we walked away too far, we've done too many things. His love never fails and it's not gonna fail you. That river is for you to draw from, that wide river. His love is gonna keep coming for you no matter what. And belief influences behavior. So if you believe in your heart, if you believe that his grace and his love and his forgiveness and his long suffering and his kindness are for you, then you are more willing to offer that grace and forgiveness and kindness to someone else because you know you weren't perfect and you weren't worthy, but he gives it to you. So then you graciously give it to others. Matthew 12 says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if your heart is full of his grace and forgiveness and knowing that he has loved you when you didn't deserve it, that's what's gonna come out of you to the world around you. My prayer for everyone this weekend is that over the last few weeks, you have opened your heart to receive God's agape love in a 
completely new and unique way. That you have allowed this series to change you, how you view his love for you and how you are to give his love to others. You are loved. There's no mistake being made. You are loved by a gracious, merciful, powerful God. He is patient and he is kind and he is for you. No matter what your life looks like right now, you're not alone. I want to encourage you to pursue this agape love that we've been learning about. Even though the series has come to an end, keep reaching for it because he's there for you. I came across this powerful video last week that I'm going to end with, and it's of a FedEx driver. Some of you may have seen it. Her name's Amanda Riggin. Um, and she literally stepped out of her busy schedule to demonstrate the love of God to a stranger. And as you watch this, I want all of us to sort of take it as a challenge that over the next seven days, we all look for opportunities to follow her example and step out and look up and reach out with God's love. As you can tell I'm at work, I just had to pull over and share something real quick. Um, as I'm delivering, uh, I pull up to this house. The lady walks out because she's checking her, her mailbox for her newspaper. And I have two boxes for her, so we start walking up the driveway together. And she asked me if I had a happy holidays. And I was telling her how busy it was. I told her I had a, a really great uh, Christmas and New Year's. And I, I asked her the same. I was like, how was your holidays? And with tears in her eyes, she said it wasn't good. And um, she said, he's sick. My husband's sick. He has cancer. I continue to small talk to try to change the subject because that's awkward. And uh, I deliver her package. She said, what's your name? I said, Amanda. And she told me her name. I drove off. Um, my heart's pounding. I, I do probably 20 more stops and I have to go back. Um, you know, with this kind of job, we're on a, a tight schedule. Um, quicker you do it, the better. The quicker you get home. I stopped what I was doing. I went back to that neighborhood and rang her doorbell and uh, asked her. She came down the stairs, and uh, she had tears in her eyes. When she saw it was me, she smiled. And I said, ma'am, can I pray with you? And she just broke down. She came out on the front porch and <laughs> squeezed me so tight. Um, this lady I've never met. She held my hand so tight, and I prayed for her and her family and for her husband. And the point of this is, is a lot of people want the Lord to use them. And, and for me as an example, I pray every day for the Lord to use me. But when he's, he's trying to use you or when you feel that call and that, that tug on your heartstrings, do you move your feet? Do you move? Because I easily could have just went, I have a hundred stops. I easily could have just went about the rest of my day thinking about it. So when you feel those tugs on your, on your heartstrings and you feel like you need to do this, stop and do it. You know what I mean? Um, oh man, that was like the most genuine hug I have received in a long time. And I just want to share that with you guys. If you, if you're praying for the Lord to help, and to use you in people's situations, when he is giving you a chance, do it. I think the first thing I resonated with when I saw that was when she said, I tried to make small talk because it was awkward. And I think that's often our go-to. But I love that she listened to the prompting of God and turned around. And, you know, we can't love the world if we don't look up and see the world. That's how we're going to change the fabric of the East Bay, by stepping out of our schedules and bringing God's agape love to the world around us. Um, would you stand with me? I'm going to close with a benediction out of uh, the book of Philippians. And this is my prayer, that your agape love may abound more and more 
in the knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.